good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We hope that you have all enjoyed your lunch. And of course, once again, a very warm welcome to Crypto Expo Asia 2023. Now, this is one of Asia's largest events for crypto, blockchain, and Web 3.0. So we're so delighted to have all of you guys come join us from different parts of the world. It's truly a great networking session for all of you to meet our fellow industry stakeholders, our thought leaders who will be coming on stage later on to share their thoughts. Now, we're so delighted that over yesterday and today, we have lined up for you over 40 high-profile speakers. So all of you are definitely in for a treat to find out more about the latest innovations and trends in the crypto industry. And so we will be proceeding on with our very first panel discussion right now, and that is defending the future of the decentralized permissionless world. And to present this to us, we have our moderator, R.C. Carnesi, Chairwoman ABI, Andy Lian, NFT from Zero to Hero book author, Marwan Zalek, Director of Growth Consensus, and Pradeep Goel, Founder and CEO of Softcare. Let's put our hands together to welcome them. <laughs> Thanks, Karen, for the introduction. So, yeah, I think um, it's an honor for me. I'm going to start with the introduction. My name is Asi. I'm the chairwoman of the Indonesia Blockchain Association. And right now, I'm very happy to share the stage with these distinguished panelists today, where we're going to talk about the defending the future of the decentralized and permissionless world. So, I have... And Dillian as the advisor in the governmental blockchain, and Marwan as the director of growth of consensus, and also Pradeep as the founder and CEO of Solvecare. I think before we go deeper into your expertise, guys, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself and your project that you do and how it is being in the part of the decentralized world. I'm going to start with you, Pradeep, please. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Pradeep Gol, I'm the CEO of Solvecare. I've been in healthcare for over 30 years, in government, in insurance, in clinical care, in chronic disease management, and in blockchain for the last six years when I started SolveCare. And we are very excited about what the opportunity is to transform healthcare for every human being on the planet, and it truly is a combination of opportunity and need. So I'm looking forward to speaking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Marwan? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, my name is Marwan. I am um, Director of Growth with Consensus. Um, I'll tell you a bit about Consensus. What we do, actually, we provide software for Web3 and developers who are building on the blockchain. Um, some software you might all be familiar with, such as MetaMask, and some software is a bit more uh, for builders, such as Infura and Diligence um, and other things. I am personally very... How to say committed to the mission of decentralization uh, because of actually where I come from. I'm originally from Tunisia, and uh, for you who don't know Tunisia, it's a country in North Africa where uh, we love paperwork and bureaucracy, and we have rules that are very centralized. Um, one example that maybe you can relate with um, the monetary system actually in my country is so protected that you cannot leave the country with more than 300 US dollars per year. So imagine if you want to go on holidays. You cannot actually swap your digital, your currency, digital, or digital paper currency from the country to outside. So it's a bit very restrictive, and it really creates a lot of um, challenges for for people who want to travel, but also people who want to create businesses and companies and want to export and import products from other countries. And so obviously, when I uh, learned about the possibilities that blockchain can bring into the to the economies and to the people's lives, um, I committed my career by switching into it uh, from a tech background. And with consensus, I actually we contribute to this mission um, on a daily basis through the software and the initiatives that we have. Great, thank you. It's nice. Uh, it's nice to meet you again, bro. So I'm Andy. I'm uh, based in Singapore. So I started the journey in uh, 2017, and then um, I start to give advice to different comp companies, and eventually um, giving advice to different government. So right now, I, I give advice to Mongolia. Uh, on a more corporate side, I'm an advisor to Bybit. And then I'm a fund manager, but uh, as you can see on the on stage, um, I just enjoy the whole process of speaking to different uh, government, um, letting them know how exactly blockchain is going to work. 
you know, how do you cope with decentralization? How can you, you know, make use of the current hype and technology to build your, your country a lot better? So that's, that's usually my role. I'm also a book author. I wrote uh, NFT from zero to hero. Um, sold about 10,000 books last year. Um, all with the good faith of telling people what is decentralization. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Okay, since we already know you guys now, um, I'm going to jump from one topic to the other since I think we have a very limited time. I'm going to start with you, Pradeep, because I did my homework and I found out that self-care just upgraded your layer two, basically to give more values to your users. You know, when we talk about the data and everything. Maruan has mentioned about bureaucracy, right? And that also something that's also an issue in Indonesia. Like as a you know, as an individual, when I want to access my health record, it's pretty limited to just one hospital and the other. So in terms of security, how do you think about when we talk about data, right, data security, how do you think we need to address the issue of security? I mean, when we talk about self-care, you work with the very sensitive data. So, yeah. So I think we need to start with the user in mind. One of the big challenges with blockchain, Web3, Adoption is user-friendliness. You cannot give the technology as it exists today to a grandma or a patient or a parent of a patient and say, use this. So you need a user layer. And then we need to have, make sure that user layer protects the user's assets. So in our world, in healthcare, but truly in every regulated industry, you have three fundamental needs of a user to interact with each other. The first is their identity. You need to be able to manage the identity in very layered, nuanced way. You don't need to know the name of my dog to write a prescription, but you might need the name of my dog to give me access to my password. So you have many dimensions of identity, and they need to be managed in a user-friendly way. The second part of this security slash usability problem is asset management. And you have your crypto assets, you have your physical assets, you have your bank assets, and you also have your data asset. Data is an asset as far as technology and, and industry is concerned. So you need to have identity married to your assets. And the third and the most important and the most difficult thing to implement is your role in the chain. Blockchain and Web3 is role-less world by design. But the world we live in is not role-less. You have a role. You have a role of a patient or a parent or a hospital administrator or a doctor, and those roles determine your ability to interact with others. So I cannot pretend to be a doctor and start writing your prescription because that's not my role. Uh, so in that sense, any kind of a real secure solution has to tie your identity, your assets, and your roles in one place. And that's the challenge. Today we have a lot of crypto wallets that only focus on one dimension, identity-less asset management, but that's not enough if you really want to drive adoption. So when you take these three pillars, identity, assets, and roles, and you allow for a human consumer who is not crypto savvy to use that, those three things properly, you're going to see adoption and you're going to see actual grandma-friendly uh, use cases. So when you talk about security, you have to look at security in a more holistic sense is what I'm trying to tell you all. Stop looking at security in the context of keys. Keys are a mechanism for security. The real question is, what are you securing? And if you don't tie those pieces together, we are going to continue to struggle with adoption, which we all know is a big issue. So in the end, wallets, similar to what we are building, and many of you will build better wallets than us, need to bring together a nuanced, multi-tiered identity with multi-tiered assets combined with multiple roles and that's when you're going to see a true security framework that government will accept, that I as a former insurance CIO would let you implement in my organization, that I as a former public health official would let you bring to my country. So those are the things that drive actual use. And that security definition I've laid out for you. You can bring me a wallet that does all three. I'll probably be your customer. Yep. I'm going to dig deeper into that, but later... Because since we're already talking about security, Maroon, and we know what's been happening recently in this ecosystem, just early this June, we know what SEC have been doing with the allegation, you know, with those crypto exchanges. So I think most of the users, even they're trying to, you know, testing the project, right? Even the protocol. 
So I'd like to know your perspective on, you know, seeing these issues. How do you think we should respond to those? Um, I think this is a this is a matter of balance. So there is a lot of totalitarian system and over controlling systems that can impose their ways of working for the sake of security, for preaching security. I am doing it for your safety. Let me read your messages, I'm doing it for your safety. Let me access your house, I'm doing it for your safety. And this is where um, perhaps centralization is not the only solution for that. There's a very good example that I usually like to give when I talk about why do we need um, decentralization and how we balance off the security aspect. Um, I usually think about how we evolved uh, the taxi system around the world. So a couple of years back, you probably all, many of you experienced it. Um, you just need to have some cash in your pocket and on the side pavement of a road, you raise your hand and you have a taxi. And you jump in, you go from A to B. Now, there is a few challenges with that, is that um, nobody knows where you are, right? Um, you have to trust the person who's picking you up. They have to trust that you have the cash. And then we lived fine with it. Um, and then we had other systems that show up, like, for example, a, um, a, sh- a ride-sharing system or Uber, where they have a review and you have a rating of this driver or how safe or how clean it is. But then in exchange, what we ended up doing is that now we're relying on the central entity, which is, let's say, Uber or Grab, to actually own our data, decide when and where we can get a taxi, how much we pay for it. And maybe for the sake of the security, they can block you from the platform and say you cannot use it. Not only in one city, but worldwide. Imagine not being able to take a taxi all all around the world. And so this is where there is other solutions that we see in normal taxi uh, and cabs. You have cameras that are installed. You have maybe a feed of those cameras going somewhere else. You can rely on other systems that are not linked to the taxi to share your uh, location with your family and say, I'm going there. And so there is solutions to security and safety that may be decentralized and may use alternative than the obvious one, which are, I admit, they're very user-friendly, right? So from your app, Uber, book, see a review, and then get allocated. But it can hit those limits at one point. And none of, none of us is actually safe. It can happen to many countries, to many governments, etc. And so... Same that happens in the, in the crypto world, bringing that back. We are building in a composable environment. And so in consensus, we do provide certain elements of security. We have, we have um, a very strong audit team for the blockchain audit. We have tools for developers to go and scan their code and make sure that it's good. Uh, MetaMask itself is um, injecting a few features um, that are already live and some of them are coming where you will have some anti-phishing and security and some clarity about certain tokens, but without being a central authority of decision. And it's up to the user to go and integrate, for example, things like um, chain analysis, which does analysis on the blockchain on top of it. Um, There is a few startups that are building extensions today to smart contracts and wallets to do recovery mechanisms if you get hacked and stolen. And so we together in this decentralized Web3 ecosystem, each building a piece that will contribute to this final security solution without pretending to say, you know, I am the, uh, I don't know, the semantic or the central authority, trust me, and I'll manage your security. That works in certain situations. and other situations where we are trying to build this decentralized finance and data ownership and, and so on, that's not the solution we want to go towards. We instead want to build multiple modular blocks that are independent from each other and can be composed in a way that it offers a total secure experience. Yeah, yeah I think... That's true. I have to agree with that. I think a lot of players now um, trying to create those kind of solutions, work together to create that kind of trust, to earn more trust on that. ND. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from the association. We work very closely with the regulators, whether it's the local or the international institutions. Like last year, we're doing the virtual asset service provider with the Financial Action Task Force. And I can see that since we're talking about security as well and all the issues that have been happening in the ecosystem, I'd like to know, like, in the discussions with the, you know, government, whether it's in Singapore or, you know, in the Asian level, what do you see, what kind of um, involvement of the government that I think we can, you know, uh, expect in the near future? I mean, we can see that they're trying to create some kind of a mitigations to, you know, those risks that already happen and... Even when we talk something bad happens in the past, it's really a lesson, even for the players, right? So, yeah, what, what's your perspective on this uh, government people? I, I, I think the different governments would have a very different perspective you know, over 
what we are trying to build right now, you know, from a, from a Web3 environment uh, to how money is being flowed from uh, country A to country B, um, and also all sorts of different regulatory issues. You know, so, so different government really have a very different sense of concern. You know, some of the more developed uh, countries, what they, what, what they want to know is that, you know, how, for example, how would uh, crypto exchanges be liable for all sorts of trading that's happening within their country and how the money is being flowed from country A to B and what kind of uh, KYC uh, is, is actually involved in the whole process. You know, then the, less, the lesser developed ones, they have uh, another set of uh, concern. You know, they are looking at things like how can we promote innovation a lot better than what we are doing right now with all the fintech companies. Because right now, as you, as you know, a lot of these uh, fintech companies are all trying to be crypto companies right now. You know, so they, they also want to know how, how can uh, crypto companies help these fintech companies to adopt to this new thinking. You know? And then of course, you know, for all government, you know, they are all thinking about, okay, so right now the money is being flowed to A, to B, and to C. How can I tax them? You know, is, it, is it part of the regime that we can capture the tax within uh, country A? You know, and then when you move to country B, what else can we enforce? You know, is there a capital gain tax? Uh, 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 these are all the things that they are looking at. You know, some other countries with very high tax or high inheritance tax, maybe 50% and above, you know, government also want to know, is there a way that, uh, you know, by introducing blockchain or by introducing crypto, you know, I couldn't tax that 55%? You know, of course, they are asking in a very professional manner. But ultimately, in my humble opinion, is that they want things to be more regulated. They want things to be accounted for. And then when it's more accounted for, they can do a lot more things from a regulatory standpoint, you know, how they deal with centralized entities, how they deal with the foundations that, are, that were all set up during the 201718 period. Tons of foundation came up, you know. So they want to know where they stand, what can be done, and what they can do. But, 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 but to be very, very honest, recently, uh, different parties from uh, different ministries, they were actually asking things like, so how do we regulate uh, MetaMask wallets? You know, so some of them, of course, they will, they will come and say, oh, I collected, some, some solution provider will say that, oh, I collected a lot of these wallet, they do analysis and things like that. So government are trying to catch up. And as they are trying to catch up, they are trying to get hold of uh, different platforms and different solutions to find suitable solutions for them to keep track and kind of uh, regulate, you know, some of the wallets that are floating out from, from their IP. So there's a lot of things that are happening and and some of them can be really extraordinary and you, you, you couldn't really think, think that they are, they are already putting their hands in trying to control some of these wallets, monitor some of these wallets that, that they, they deem is sensitive. So this, these are all things that are really happening on the ground. Yep. Very great. So I'd just like to follow that up. I think the other things that I find is the concern of our government. I think it's also about the anti-money laundering and terrorism financing, right? And we also see that a lot of trends... Uh, around AI, right? Artificial intelligence. So I think, you know, if you can share your ideas about, you know, the role of anti, uh, artificial intelligence on the specific role on on-chain analytics, what do you think, Andy? Well, I, I think that is, a, that is a big must. You know, in fact, I was, um, I was giving a presentation to uh, some of the family offices and uh, wealth groups that actually Web3 is not very decentralized. You know, because a lot of these uh, Web3 entities are owned by perhaps the VCs, you know, perhaps owned by many uh, big centralized entities. And, and to be honest, if, if that, that is what's going to happen, it, it will not be very decentralized. And if it's not very decentralized and it's been controlled by that few, few folks, then what is the purpose of uh, what we are trying to do? So there's one keynote speech that I gave. I, 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 I term it as uh, Web4. So it's actually, uh, it's actually very heavily relying on the AI technology um, together with the statistics that we can get. And of course, with the intention of uh, being permissionless, you know, zero knowledge and so forth, 
it forms a, a it forms another consensus on its own. You know, I I do believe in quotes a lot better than human being. So so I, the, the web four theory is is something that that is not too far away. I think. Right. Agree with that. So Marin, I think if we talk about crypto. Well, also, although I'm sure people here are very, you know, like into crypto, but I think doubts regarding crypto is still there in the, you know, traditional institutions, right? But I think that's also very interesting how at the very beginning of this year, as an association in Indonesia, we get a lot of interest from banks, you know, that li- they like to explore how this technology can, you know, support them and, you know, create new products or services for the users, right? So I like to know, uh, you know, how do you see these in- traditional institutions implementing, you know, digital assets, like, and how's the uptake so far? Um, I think actually to answer this question, I'll probably have to separate digital assets from the blockchain technology. Yeah. So the first thing is uh, the fundamental of this whole industry that we are in is that there is a tech that allows you to do certain things in a certain way. And this tech has different benefits. And so, for example, for us, perhaps me and Andy, it has the benefit that we can trust each other without having a third party that we need to rely on. But then for a bank or, a, or an exchange, it has the benefit that it makes transactions, finality, and settlement quicker and immediate. And so when we see certain use cases built on this technology, some of them are meant to be peer-to-peer decentralized. If you go to a DeFi protocol where I can lend and borrow on it, and it has a token associated that I can own to vote on how that protocol goes as a participant, that is a decentralized solution that will serve a particular use case. Right? Some other people, some other customers, some other users, it's easier for them to do the lending and borrowing through a bank, for example. But it would be great for those customers that their lending and borrowing settles within a second. And that's where the bank has a vested interest to go and build a platform using blockchain technology to do such a thing. And so the interest that we saw in the market over the last couple of years from institutions and bank and and central bank is really in the blockchain technology itself. And looking at it to say, well, how can we... Uh, revamp our infrastructure, our mainframe that is, you know, hundreds of years, I don't know how old it is, uh, into a more modern thing using this technology and benefit from it. It's not actually to create crypto and assets and, and, you know, those assets you can trade them on OpenSea. No, it's it's very different. That's one thing. The other thing is actually institutions that are a little bit less, let's say, um, restricted. And so, for example, we're seeing a lot of Web2 companies and consumer companies who are exploring now Web3 in its decentralized form to create new channels of engagement and marketing with the users. So those you will see them perhaps doing things with OpenSea, with MetaMask. And they will try to understand this technology and experiment with Initiative A, Initiative B to see, to see how it goes. Uh, we all heard about the crazy metaverse that apparently feels like 10 years old, but you know, th- those are experimentation to see how, how these things are going. And so for us, when we engage with these uh, companies, Usually we try to understand, okay, what is your use case? What is your story? Because for each one, they will need a different approach to it. Some of them, they're just about the tech, so we'll just go and install the tech and work with them to make that um, framework for them to be able to serve their clients better. Some actually are responding to customer demand. So there is a few um, institutions who are saying, well, listen, my actual customers are taking their money out of the bank to go and buy Bitcoin. So I need to create a system in between that allows me to provide them with that service so they can buy Ethereum and Bitcoin, but still using my banking system. So those are probably hybrid solution. It's not fully decentralized, but it also has that gateway into the Web3. Um, yeah, so repeating myself a little bit, but essentially uh, each use case is a bit different. They will use a portion of the technology, maybe a portion of the established applications outside, whether it's OpenSea or Aave or whatnot. Um, and some are just meant for, for us to you know, interact together. I think there's a transition there from the you know traditional institution, right, getting into the decentralized world. So, Pradeep, I'm going to go back with you. And we also already talked about security. But when we talked about blockchain, there are other things like scalability, right, and then interoperability. So what I'd like to know is maybe helping some of the enterprises who's coming here, you know, where they want to implement blockchain. Like, how is it we can do to keep the balance between this trilemma? 
Sorry, between what and what? The three lemma, the security, scalability, and interoperability in implementing blockchain. So look, um, there is no easy answer, but if you think about first, we are here to talk about defending a decentralized, permissionless world. For whom? For the consumer. If we don't make this decentralized, permissionless world work for the average consumer, there's nothing to defend. Now, we all talk a lot about regulation, the governance, the, the issue with country rules and how the SEC is cracking down. But remember one thing, regulation follows industry, always. Industry follows value. If we create really compelling use cases that people cannot live without, regulation will follow. I'll give you an anecdote to illustrate the point. I was running a large healthcare organization I had an IT department of several thousand people, and like everybody else, we had set these stupid rules, like you cannot bring your own phone or your laptop to work. Bring your own device was not allowed. Security, compliance, regulation, right? And then one day, one of my board members got a gift from his grandson of a something called iPad. And he showed up at the board meeting with this iPad, and he said to us, I want to use my iPad when I'm in the board meeting. Within seven days, a bring-your-own-device policy was changed. We allowed new devices to come into the organization. You could choose your iPhone or your iPad. And within a 20-year-old policy was changed in one week because the right person said, I can't live without this application. So you damn well go change your rules. My point is we are talking about blockchain, Web3 in the abstract. We are demonstrating techno-arrogance, and we are talking about it as a technology. Nobody cares. What people care about is what you're going to do for me with this tech. And if you demonstrate that indefeatable uh, use case that they cannot live without, guess what happens? They, those people elect politicians. Politicians change laws, and regulators follow the law. I've been a regulator. I don't write laws that my polit political landscape doesn't allow me to do. So we, as an or, as a ecosystem of blockchain, Web3, AI, machine learning, mobile computing, no matter what the tech jargon we are using, we need to focus on bringing grandma into the fold. And till we do that, we're just going to be a bunch of people sitting around talking about the art of possibilities, not the art of doing. Now, coming back to your question, interoperability is a huge issue in healthcare. But instead of trying to do system interoperability, blockchain will let you do human interoperability. Think about that. Instead of me having to have my hospital connect to the ph pharmacy and the pharmacy connect to the lab, what if I could be the connection point with everybody? You could subscribe to me and get all the data from me and send all the data to me. What a concept. What if I was the interoperability hub, not some in invisible network like Skynet in the sky, but I as a human control my data? You are the interoperability hub, and everybody would get that principle. You talk about scalability. Well, look, you're going to have scalability issues based on the use case. If I'm transacting with my doctor four times a year, and the response time is not four seconds, but 45 seconds, it's still heck of a lot better than driving 45 minutes to go see the doctor or wait 45 days for the appointment. So scalability is contextual. We are implementing solutions both at the micro and the national level, and we have found that scalability is not a function of number of people on the chain, but a function of the, va the transactional speed you can afford and the cost of the transaction that you are willing to pay. So interoperability, scalability, and ultimately the interconnectivity of all these technologies is not in itself an end goal. The end goal is the use case. And on that, you can solve it. So you have interchain connectivity, you have mobile computing, you have regional node, you have sharding of the chains. There is no shortage of technological solutions to solve these problems. The problem here is we seem to be a pro solution looking for a problem. And if you address that issue first, then all these issues are addressed quickly. And a final note, we are still on Ethereum despite all its crazy fees and ups and downs, because we just built a layer two chain to abstract everything from layer one. So now we can enforce role-based, relationship-based transactions that are 100 times faster, and they still anchor on Ethereum, problem solved. 
So guys, if you have a problem that you're really intent on solving, there is a technological solution for it. I've been in, this, in healthcare IT for 35 years. I haven't met a problem I can't solve yet. The problem we have as, an organ as a whole blockchain ecosystem is that we seem to be talking in the abstract. And I would say to you again, you want better regulation? Make a use case the world can't live without. Regulation will support you. I guarantee you that. Thank you, Pradeep, for sharing your perspective. Maren, I'm going to go back to you because you, what you just shared before, I believe you work with quite a lot of companies, right, on a specific use cases. What I'd like to know is, um, well, I, I won't ask you to predict too far, just maybe one in the next year. What do you think are three key steps, you know, in an enterprise to win the emerging market in Asia since we're covering Asia, right? And... With that, I'd like to hear you to define the word win. Want to talk about the Asian market, please. I, I was going to ask you for the definition before I answer. <laughs> right. um, I think Pradeep made some very solid points about the, the use case and, and whatnot. So it really depends on what you're trying to solve. Um, I've, been, I've been in Singapore and in Southeast Asia for 12 years now, and so you see a lot of particularities between one country and another, and the you know, the problems that you see in Hong Kong, it's not the same that you see in yeah. Indonesia, it's not the same you see in Vietnam, etc. And so winning really uh, depends. So take, for example, a, um, I don't know, a financial system that you're looking at uh, allowing users to pay or, or transfer money. For them, for example, winning a Singapore market, it's more about the key accounts and volume per account. So, you know, sign top um, family offices and they will be trading millions of dollars. If they are going to a market such as uh, Philippines, for example, perhaps it's about the international remittance for the, yeah. for the, um, you know, the helpers ecosystem in, in, in Asia. So it's more about number of users with very small fees and transactions. And so winning really depends on which market you're solving for and what's your offering. And certain offerings work in certain markets, not others. Now, obviously, to facilitate that, um, back to the point, the users are not us, are not you know, these tech people who are familiar with setting up a MetaMask wallet and so on. And so what we are looking for is really solving for these annoying technicalities, having gas, money, having the right token in your wallet address, having to remember seed phrases, um, you know, having to double check the address that you entered 10 times because once it goes, it doesn't come back. Um, so all of these are the things that we are following very closely over the next few months. <clears throat> and there is some solid solutions. Again, technology really is very easy to, to, to build. It's just a matter of doing the cycles, putting it into a use case, getting feedback loop, improving it, and learning from whatever did not work. So there's a few things being worked on in that aspect. And the goal really here is to have that infrastructure layer that now allows me to not worry about security, ease of use, whether... You know, some, somebody who even uneducated, unbanked from a mobile phone, low end, can scan maybe a QR code and they're all set up. They can already use the application that we have. And so it's our job, I believe, as companies such as Consensus and other companies like us to build this infrastructure to improve these things without going into technicalities of what they are. But they essentially that they're security, they are user experience um, uh, features that are needed. And once these are built, I believe that there will be a lot of enterprises that are picking up and saying, well, you know, imagine within your browser, you don't have to set up any wallet or anything like that. Your browser is able to do that and keep in the browser itself the, the digital assets. I think there is some initiatives like Brave uh, browser has that as well. There is a few other more popular browsers we're working with to have that feature. And so these are the things we're looking for, similar as well with email accounts and, and whatnot. Uh, and once those are in place... It becomes just a business problem, not a blockchain problem, not a Web3 problem. It's more of like, who are the community I'm serving? What's the, what are they needed? And what can I build for them? And that's how you'd win it. And there is a lot to go around. So <laughs> everybody can win. Thanks, Maureen. Andy, I'd like to talk a little bit about CBDC. Because I, I think as an Indonesian, I'm very proud that just recently Indonesia launched a white paper of CBDC or CBDC. But I also understand that there are a lot of perspective out there who see that CBDC is, you know, some kind of a, oh, because of country are doing it, so we cannot, you know, be left behind, so we have to do it, something like that. Or even as a, you know, as a citizen, we think that, oh, this is just a way of our government have access, you know, to our financials, right, finances. So, yeah, what's your thought on that, Andy? 
I think CBDC is a, is, 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 is a good thing to have. You know, if you look at it from a different perspective, from a, maybe from a more government perspective, because they are, they are worried about how the money is being flowed in and out, and there's no way you can track from a more decentralized manner. There's no way you could really track if the, your crypto has gone into a mixer, right? But there's always ways that they can track when they cash out, right? So CBDC would actually be a very good way to track where the money are going. It gives the government a form of assurance that, hey, oh, actually the money is there. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's tax them, you know. Let's get, get some tax out, uh, out from there. I think it gives the government a, a, a sense of knowing to make them feel a bit safer that, oh, okay, things like this could be done. And, and that will also help us in terms of uh, adoption. Because if the government is, is, is uh, happy and they know a li- little bit more, they can open up a bit more and then the adoption will, will then grow a lot faster. You know, maybe my grandmother would know how to use a MetaMask in, in, a, in, in, in some time down the road. But, but coming back to CBDC as well, there's always uh, two sides to, to all these things. There's a good side and, of course, the bad side. Um, it also depends on which country you're from, right? If you're in a country where, where inflow and outflow is huge or where there are a lot of corruption, for example, you know, CBDC is kind of a, a, a warning sign to tell them that, hey, you know, what you're doing right now is all being tracked, you know. But from a more innovation standpoint is that now you could eventually use your, your money anywhere you want because everything is digitized. Everything is digitized, trackable. And again, that, that is a, that's another big step towards, uh, towards cryptocurrency, you know, how everyone can have cryptocurrency, how they can buy and sell a lot quicker, you know, without knowing how you can set up a decentralized wallet and so forth. So I think that's part and parcel of how decentralization can move further. Maybe, I, I, maybe I'm looking at it from a very positive aspect, but, but I still find that there are more pros than cons in terms of a CBDC. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think with the CBDC, we see that a lot of central bank and a lot of countries doing their research on that. So, and just two days ago, I think U.S. Congress uh, doing a hearing about you know the future of digital assets, and you know they're trying to create a cl- clarity on a, a, how they want to you know regulate cr- a digital asset, right? And you also mentioned about how the government has their own perspective on crypto since there's a CBDC. So, what I like to ask is actually. What do you think, um, you know, would there be a changing in the way of crypto is regulate, you know, since a lot of countries now having their own, just like what Marwan has mentioned, it could be very different from one country to the other, right? So what can we expect, you know, in terms of crypto regulation? I think crypto regulation is kind of, uh, I mean, it's kind of standard, to be honest, you know, how, how, what crypto is acceptable, what, what is not. But I think the other problem that we should really address um, is, um, you know, the, the recent incident from a U.S. SEC, for example. I, I, think, I think it is important to be very clear, you know, what is security and what is a commodity? How do you define it? If, if there is no clarity on that part, then everyone will be in a limbo. I said, oh, so, what, so, so why is Ethereum not a security, for example? You know, and why is a Solana a security? So, so there, there are a lot of all these questions in, 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 in mind, uh, not only with us, you know, with some of the banks, with some of the institutions, they are all trying to be very careful. You know, so ultimately, I think defining what security really is is a, is, is a, is a really big thing. And, and are we still going to follow the Howey test that is, uh, I think, started in 1940s, you know? Is that still relevant? So I, I wrote a lot of articles about that, uh, uh, in fact. And I think there is a big case moving forward, you know, how we should really look at securities, how we look at digital assets, and how we look at cryptocurrency as a whole. That kind of definition is a must. And I, I think it is not, especially not very clear, you know, at this current moment. Yeah, agree. Thanks, Andy. So since we don't really have much time left, I'm going to ask a, a closing question to Every, each one of you, since we're talking about the, uh, you know, the decentralized world, what can we anticipate you know, in the near future when we talk about the permissionless world? Uh, anyone? 
So I can try to answer it from the healthcare perspective and from enterprise adoption perspective. I think from a decentralization, um, there is clearly a case to be made for lower costs, more consumer engagement, more effective, whatever mission you have, healthcare, finance, logistics, supply chain, there's clearly efficiencies there. Those are not the issue. There is certainly a degree of concern around people's mind separation of blockchain from crypto assets. And as Marvin said, we need to clearly distinguish that and industry is starting to embrace that. There is clearly a concern around regulatory overreach, which makes a typical enterprise very concerned about adopting it. And again, the answer lies in clarity and regulation. And that will come because the, the economic value of blockchain is there. So I go back to my previous statement. Value drives regulation. Regulation never creates value. Value always creates regulation. So if we can demonstrate, and the inevitability of progress is that regulation doesn't stop it. It only delays it. So end of the day, as we implement blockchain in the enterprise for the benefit of the consumer, regulation will catch up. We have to be brave enough to identify those use cases, implement them, and do so in a manner that we're not blatantly violating current existing laws. Much as we would like blockchain to transform the world, you have to transform an industry, and you transform that by implementing good use cases. So coming back to what I know, healthcare, we are beginning to demonstrate improved mortality, reduced death rate, in, in reduced drug failure, in, improved clinical trials, and reduced cost of administration. So enterprises are adopting it. They're not, as long as they know that we are not skirting the law, we're not hitting the edge, the boundary condition of the, of the law, they are happy to adopt it. But for it to be fully realized, regulation will need to eventually become friendlier. So we work on both sides of the equation. We work with the client to implement. We work with the regulator to regulate better. And the regulator is always going to be three to five years behind. No, there's no way they're going to stay current. So the job is to create value that draw, drags the regulation forward. But I overall see the value to be so clear and so compelling that I'm a net optimist. Challenges remain. Hurdles are going to be there. We're going to hit road bumps, but there's no wall. We're going to keep moving forward. And with the enterprise adoption coming, through which you get to millions of consumers at a time, right? I can go out there and advertise on TV and try to get a million wallets but if I get one insurance company to adopt, they have 7 million um, um, uh, insured members, no amount of advertising will get me there. So enterprise adoption of compelling use cases for the benefit of the consumer is where the value lies, in my opinion. And we are starting to see real adoptions. So the future is very compelling. We just need to stay focused. Thank you, Pradeep. Maroon, Andy, short one, please. Yeah, I, I just want to leave you actually with my um, case for why we need this decentralization. Uh, we are all very lucky that many of us, not all, but uh, we belong into healthy economies, healthy governments. Um, but we have to think a bit more global scale. There is a lot of actually uh, struggling societies, struggling governments, struggling countries. And having a decentralized system is really the only way out to support economies, to support people, to be able luckily not even have to use it, but as a plan B, can continue actually operating and trading and exchanging value without relying on a failing central government. So, you know, we're building not just for ourselves, we're building for everybody else. And just forget about countries and society. we all kind of the same humans. If it happens somewhere else, it will get to you eventually. So what, that's what we're building for. And that's why we need this. Thank you. And uh, a real, real quick one. I think uh, let's not talk about blockchain and and a lot of airy fairy kind of things. I hope that blockchain can be embedded in our lives and we don't need to really talk about it, you know. And if that is going to happen, I think adoption will, ha will hit a certain level. That's number one. Number two is um, in order for us to have a better future for the decentral, to, you know, in a more decentralized manner, permissionless world, I think we all have to do the right thing. You know, if, if we want to build a project, let's build the project in the most decentralized manner that you, you know. You know, that will help to keep the system clean and that will help to give us a better future. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I think that closed our session today. Thanks again, Pradeep, Marion and Andy. And Karen, back at you.